We've been going through this here book of Jasher. Um, hallelujah. Last time we were on um, Rekion and we went through how Rekion left from Babylon and went to Egypt and made a name for himself. And in making a name for himself, he became the first pharaoh. Um, as you see at the end of chapter 14, it says, and all the inhabitants of Egypt greatly loved Rekion Pharaoh. And they made a decree to call every king that should reign over them and their seed in Egypt, Pharaoh, based off of this Rekion, who was from Babylon. It says, therefore, all the kings that reigned in Egypt from the time four were called Pharaoh unto this day. So Rekion wasn't even what we would call Egyptian. He moved there through cunning and craftiness he got all his wealth and pharaoh them was 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 uh wasn't feeling him at first but was digging him in the end and they gave him a title all kind of how uh yosef was when he was there he was second to king rekion was is something was something similar to that except he did it through um being slick really and yosef did it through being obedient to yah and, and the things that yah had did for him but he became Pharaoh, which was second to the king. But as we see at the end of G at the, at the end of Joshua 14, verse 33, it says that from that time forward, all the kings began to be named Pharaoh. Show you how much the people in the end started to feel Rekion. And we're going to pick this up at 15 when Abraham goes to Egypt. So I think that's why they put that there to show us how we got to Pharaoh, because now Pharaoh is going to become a conversation. Um, with that being said, would anybody like to open us up in prayer? As we begin. All right, well. I got you. Hallelujah. Oh, Father, yeah. We come to you on bended knees, a face to the ground, begging you to protect us to lead us in all decisions, to uh, increase this, the understanding of this lesson tonight, that we reach a word and it becomes much clearer to us that once we understand what it's all about, that we can incorporate this into our soul and into our minds and understand how wise you are in having things written in such a way that we can study and improve our abilities, but most of all that we understand that you are a living Elohim, but we are your people and we wish to reformulate what our ancestors had torn apart because we dearly love you and we want to come closer and closer to you. And we can only do that by study and prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for watching over us and coming back to us for waking us up and starting us on a path of righteousness that our uh, understanding to follow your light and your lead is what we need most, not anything else other than to understand what you want us to do and for us to follow. Heavenly Father, bless those who uh, was not able to uh, make this call tonight, bless them. Bless everyone on this call. And Heavenly Father, for those that are in need of prayer, wherever they are and whatever they're doing, that uh, your holy messengers go out and touch them, that they may uh, understand that their lives has to be structured in a certain way to follow you, that you're here for the good of us all. Uh, because we are many Hebrews that have been transplanted here as you 
had wished us to do many years ago. So Heavenly Father, we thank you again, and we will try to glean everything from uh, this lesson that you have put there for us in the name of Hashima, um, in the name of your son, Yeshua, we pray to you. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Beautiful, beautiful prayer. Over beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful prayer. Shalom, everyone. Shalom. Hallelujah. Thanks for the prayer. Thank you for the prayer. It was a beautiful prayer. Always on time. Jasher chapter 15. Um, you're making good time in this Jasher too. <laughs> you got a couple chapters down some days. I think we're gonna have a two chapter day coming up. One of these chapters is pretty small. Um, okay. So, I know the podcast actually next. Okay. So in Jasher chapter 15, it says that anybody can interject at any time. We're going to be going through when Abraham or Abram at this time, he's still Abram. It's going to go to Egypt. So Genesis chapter 12 is where we're at in the, in the King James or what we would call the Bible. And it says, and in that year, excuse me, there was heavy famine throughout the land of Canaan. And the inhabitants of the land could not remain on account of the famine, for it was very grievous. So it was a really bad famine, which, you know, now that I think about Rekion um, being anointed in Egypt almost like yourself. This famine makes sense as well. But we're going to see a difference is that he, Egypt isn't as prepared as they are under Yosef naturally. But Rekion has kind of ascended in Egypt in that manner. And you all will get why I keep bringing him up. But it was a grievous famine in Canaan so bad that people were having to move. And Abram and all, and all belonging to him rose and went down to Egypt on account of the famine. And when, when, and when they were at the brook Mitzrayim, which I'm assuming is the Nile River, they remained there some time to rest from the fatigue of the road. And Abram and Sarah were walking at the border of the brook Mitzrayim, and Abram beheld his wife, Sarah, that she was very beautiful. And Abram said to his wife, Sarah, since Elohim has created thee with such a beautiful continent, I am afraid of the Egyptians, lest they should slay me and take thee away. For the fear of Elohim is not in these places. And I thought that to be interesting, first off, that he would say it or address it like that. The fear of Elohim is not in these places. And mind you, we're in the backdrop of the Tower of Babel has come down and they last, uh, not the chapter where we're, I think they spoke about it in Rekion too, but the chapter before that as well. Um, it keeps keying on that. All of these nations have started to spread around the world since the tower came down. Egypt became, Egypt has become what it's become since the tower has come down, right? And for Abram to be like, well, the fear of Elohim is, it in these, is not in these places. It says to me that as the world has started to spread from the tower, um, there's a certain level of wickedness in certain spots to where it's known. And we know Sodom has already begun to be, be established. Um, other spots as well, anciently, just thinking off the top of my head, you would have what we would call Sumer or Sumeria would be um, around this time um, when they talk about like Elam or Akkadian empires and things like that. You know, that we know that there are different nations, and there's more than that because they're starting to go into Europe then. 
the that caucus mountain region that we brought up when we talked about um when they in chapter 10 of Jasher where it broke down more in depth the the lineage of the sons especially Yafeth that caucus mountain region as people were migrating from modern day Turkey Iraq Babylonish when the city of Yafeth was going north they went through that region where the caucus mountain is at that's kind of what the way that people migrated into Europe um they're starting to populate in that region and a little further, that region being what we know to be like Armenia, um, Ukraine would be in there, Southern Russia would be in there. Um, Hermetic people are starting to go into uh, mainland, I'll say Africa, because we understand the Middle East, or at least the most of it would have been considered Northeast Africa, if you want to put it in those terms. Um, but it's just interesting that Abram is saying the fear of Elohim is not in these places, showing that. And the fear of Elohim wasn't in Babylon either, because we see what they were doing. But yet at that time, people had the understanding in the language. They knew who Yah was, but the fear of him was not there. And it shows that that mentality early on has started to spread to these different populations that are springing up. Um, after the fall of the tower. Verse five, Abram says, surely then thou shalt do this. Say thou art my sister to all that may ask thee in order that it may be well with me and that we may live and not be put to death. So Abram is like, these people don't fear Yah. They down here worshiping and living in the old kind of way, which we know that to especially understand is how sodomy is at this time. Um, it probably is known that if you go down there, the Egyptians be tripping and they, they didn't kill men and took their wives and things like that. I'm sure that's probably a story that's been heard too. That's why this is on his mind. Um, he's telling Sarah to say that she's his sister which she is the daughter of his brother. She's really his niece and true. Um, same as Lot. I believe him earlier on, it said that Lot and Sarah were brother and sister in this. They were Haran's children who died in the furnace with Abel. But be that as it may, um, we just see the recklessness of this. And, you know, it's still, it's still I don't want to say, it's, I don't know if it's places, but. This type of mentality still goes on in the world where, um, you know, where men try to buy men wives and, and, you know, because a man may have more than the next man, he may try to use his wealth to leverage a situation with a man's wife and, and not even thinking of the, the swinger, just completely unclean type of mentality that's in the world, which is here as well. Um, but just on a more simple level, we see uh um this type of behavior amongst men also in this world abram feared that they were going to put him to death for sarah also telling us how beautiful our our um the matriarch of um israel is um she would be the matriarch of more than israel though she would be the matriarch of um uh she would be the matriarch of, of, of Isaac, which would make her the matriarch of the Edomites as well. Um, so she would be the matriarch of Edom and Israel, right? But it just lets you know how fine she was. And it also speaks to why men were probably choosing the daughters of Edom as well. Um, coming from this lineage, they were probably nice looking women as well. Moving forward, verse six, and Abram commanded the same to all those that came with him to Egypt. Remember, it's a lot of people with him. They said 300 left with him from Babylon. And then when he was amongst the Canaanites and the places he'd been going, people been latching on to him like, we want to go with you. And it said, and I think it was last chapter, it talked about how he taught, he was teaching everybody with him the ways of Yah that he learned from Shem and Noah when he lived with them. So it says that he told all the people with him on account of the famine, also, his nephew Lottie commanded, saying, if the Egyptians ask thee concerning Sarah, say she is the sister of Aram. So he told all the people with him, too, like, look, this is what y'all are going to do. When we get down here, anybody asks, Sarah is my sister. Abram 
and we know between Lot and him, they probably four, maybe 500 people strong. So this is, it's, it ain't just like a handful of us. This is a lot of people that he had to tell, like, look, this is how we're going to play it when we get down here um, for Sarah. Uh, any questions or comments anybody want to add on the first six verses before we move forward? Verse 7, and yet with all these orders, Abram did not put confidence in them. But he took Sarai and placed her in the chest and concealed her amongst their vessels. For Abram was greatly concerned about Sarai on account of the wickedness of the Egyptians. So you could just imagine what he would heard about this place already. This also speaks to how grievous this famine had to be that he already had a preconceived notion that these people was extremely wicked. Mind you, he's coming from Babylon and where Nimrod and Nadin, you know, they, they didn't even watch the tower go up and fall and the worship of these gods and the things they was doing. So this 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 worry he has about these Egyptians is it's saying a lot that Abram would. Yeah, plus, he was just in Canaan. He'd have been amongst the Amorites and different kings there. Um he didn't been around a multitude of people, but he is overly concerned about the way the, the things that they're hearing about these Egyptians. Um, I think that says a lot about what Egypt already was. And we know Rekion is here. And it said Rekion came from Babylon. He was um, a student, all of the worldly wisdoms or whatnot. And he's here. He didn't rose to power here. Now, we know when Abraham, a few chapters back, when Abram, when Nimrod put Abram in the furnace because he um, broke all of the, the, the idols of, of um, Terah, and Terah really gave his son up, fearing for his own life, right? It said that all of the people gathered to see it. So it's a good chance Abram then got word of Rekion here, and he know him. It's an even better chance, though, that Rekion knows Abram. We know that after that, it said Nimrod and all the princes gave Abram a bunch of gifts, and he was exhausted, kind of like Daniel was in Babylon, right? Not to that extent, because they were still trying to fight against Abram, but he was put on a certain, everybody knew his story. So that's why I keep bringing up Rekion, because he's here now, and he would be aware of Abram, and if even if he wasn't aware of Abram, he would definitely have been aware of Terah, because Terah had a high rank and position in Nimrod's, um, I don't want to say army, but just amongst Nimrod's princes and counselors and the people close to him. So that you know, the, the family in general would be known by Rekion. And, and it's a good chance Abram done heard about Rekion, and they know he down here. And that may be why he looking at it like it's so wicked, because he may be thinking. Dude was wicked back at home. He used to worship some anything with my daddy them. And now he down here and they done put him in a role. Almost like he a Nimrod number two type of figure in Abram's mind when he's thinking of Rekion. Verse eight. And Abram and all belonging to him rose up from the brook Mitzrayim and came to Egypt. And they had scarcely entered the gates of the city when the guards stood up to them saying, give tithe to the king from what you have and then you may come into the town. And Abram and those that were with him did so. So it said scarcely. He, he barely even entered the city. The guards owned everybody coming. But they say and give tithe to the king. Remember last chapter, Rekion started to make people give tithe to, the, to himself, which ended up going to the king. He started collecting taxes for death and doing things like that. So as soon as Abram gets here, these policies and this knowledge that Rekion has given to these Egyptians is already starting to show itself, right? This give tithe to the king and all that. This is, this is, that's in the same mentality of the things that Rekion was doing. Um, Rekion was doing with them last chapter. One second. One second, one second. There we go. 
So they asked him for a tithe just to come into the city. And that's that's Recky. That's that's the things that he was just doing in the last chapter, who, who went on to become Pharaoh at his time. No, Pharaoh was under the king. But it said that after his death, they started to call every king Pharaoh. And Abraham and those who were with him did so. And Abraham had a lot already. The Babylonians gave him a bunch of gifts before he left. Um, the Amor uh, yeah, I think when he was amongst the Amorites, they might have gave him gifts. Um, we know Terah wasn't a poor man and he was with his father. Um, I, I don't know how rich Abram is, but he's not poor. He has things and he has all these servants. They say that it was 300 plus has been me and leaning with him. You know, he has things. They have cattle. Lot has cattle. <laughs> they have things. And Abram, with the people that were with him, came to Egypt. And when they came, they brought the chest in which Sarah was concealed. And the Egyptians saw the chest. And the king's servants approached Abram saying, what hast thou here in this chest, which we have not seen? They're like, what you got in there? <laughs> what do you got? Now open thou the chest and give tithe to the king of all that it contains. So he gave a tithe, but then they see this chest and they're like, wait, what's in there? You didn't gave us a tithe, but they really thinking he gave us a tithe, but this is where he keep all the gold and the jewels at. He, he only gave us a tithe of the things we see. He ain't gave us a tithe of everything he got. That's really what they're thinking. And Abram said, this chest I will not open, but all you demand upon it, I will give. I don't want to open the chest, but anything you see that I got, I'll give you even more of what I got, which he has a lot already. And say, and Pharaoh's officers answered Abram. Who was Pharaoh at the time? Is Rekion. He's still alive. Rekion is here. I think it, we know he's here because chapter one say, and in that year there was heavy famine. We see this is coming from 14, which is the year when Rekion rose to power. So it's showing us that this man who came from Babylon who is hard to believe he's not, he don't know who Terah and Abram to me is because Abram's departure and everything that didn't happen in Babylon just done been too incredible, right? And saying, Pharaoh's officers answered, Abram saying, it is a chest of precious stones. Give us the tenth thereof. Abram said, all that you desire, I will give, but you must not open the chest. And the king's officers pressed Abram and they reached the chest and opened it with force, and they saw, and behold, a beautiful woman was in the chest. So it was a fight. They said they reached in and opened it by force. It was, it was, a, it was a struggle. Abram, Abram, and, and the servants that was with him, um, it was a standoff to open his chest. They didn't just open it willingly, and they said they opened it by force and saw a beautiful woman in the chest. And when the officers of the king beheld Sarah, they were struck with admiration at her beauty. And all the princes and servants of Pharaoh, Rekiah, assembled to see Sarah, for she was very beautiful. And the king's officers ran and told Pharaoh all that they had seen, and they praised Sarah to the king. And Pharaoh ordered her to be brought, and the woman came before the king. And as you see, this Pharaoh is Rekiah still, and he's the one having her brought to the king, right? And maybe they honoring him as king because remember we seen that the king only comes and deals with the people once a year. We seen that in last chapter with Rekia. So as, as we're, um, he's in play here and he may know Sarah. Remember Abraham at this time is approaching 60, 70 years old. Sarah is 10 years younger than him. So she's 50. You know, she isn't like a teenager or nothing. And he, Brecky, I may be aware of Sarah because she ain't just got beautiful. That You know, the people in Babylon probably used to tell Tara he had a beautiful uh, granddaughter as well as he was one of these head men in the house of Nimrod. 
And it says, and Pharaoh ordered her to be brought. This would be Rechiah. And the woman came before the king. And like I said, they may be honoring, as you see, the king is lowercase here too. They may be honoring Pharaoh as the second in command as the king in the true king's absence because the king is only coming to deal with the Egyptians once a year. We know that from last chapter. And Pharaoh beheld Sarah and she pleased him exceedingly. And he was struck with her beauty and the king rejoiced greatly on her account and made presents to those who brought him the tidings concerning her. So he gave presents to these guards who opened his chest and brought her by force. Now just think the guards who did all this, they didn't even ask what she married. They just took her. Which goes back to what Abram was saying before they got here. Elohim is not in these places. They live in lawless. And the woman was then brought to Pharaoh's house and Abram grieved on account of his wife. And he prayed to the Most High Yah to deliver her from the hands of Pharaoh. And Sarah also prayed at that time and said, O oh Yah, thou didst tell my master, Abram, to go from his land and from his father's house to the land of Canaan. And thou did promise to do well with him if he would perform thy commands. Now behold, we have done that which thou did command us. And we left our land and our families. And we went to a strange land and to a people whom we have not known before. Now see, Sarah at this time is, is saying that Canaan, even Egypt, is a people that we have not known before. That's important as you go forward with prophecy too, because when prophecy starts saying, I'm going to send you into captivity in the land that you nor your fathers have known. By the time we get to that, our fathers have known because Abram and I, I think Isaac went there. I'm not sure if he went to Egypt too, but Abram has been to Egypt. So now our fathers would have known these lands, these customs, these people, whatever you want to call it. And we came to this land to avoid the famine. And this evil accident has befallen me. Now, therefore, O Yahuwah, Elohim of our of Noah and Shem, is how she might have would have said it. Deliver us and save us from the hand of this oppressor, and do well with me for the sake of thy mercy. And Yahuwah hearkened to the voice of Sarah, and the Most High Yah sent an angel to deliver Sarah. From the power of Pharaoh. And this Pharaoh is important because this is Rechion from Babylon. And he knows them. He definitely knows Abram. Even if it's just his terror son. But when we seen at that furnace, it said that all of Babylon came to see Abram go into that furnace. That story would have been really big news, really big business in Babylon. Pharaoh, Rechion, this man from Babylon who didn't craftily gain this position in Egypt. I just feel like there's more at play here with him when it comes to Abram and Sarah. Any questions or comments on any of this we've read so far? Yeah, shalom, Ma. Shalom. Yeah. Um... You know, just thinking about the whole situation with, uh, you know, with Abraham, I just have a question. Did uh, Abraham and Sarah pray before they before this, or they just had their own plan? That's the first question. I don't think that they had a prayer first, and that's where the that's where it seems like the prayers from the backside. You know, the father is still, you know, he's still going to take care of us. You know, even if we are thinking righteous and I, it makes me think of he's our rear guard you know even though you know we, we think oh i'm gonna go ahead and handle this you know um I, i'm gonna handle it with my own wisdom but that's not really what you need to do you don't have to worry about it and then i guess the second thing you can answer that first part remember that you know is did they pray i don't know if anybody has seen anything about that mm -hmm. but the second part of of it is um the land has fallen into whoredom. 
That's where you don't recognize marriage. You don't recognize the covenant agreement. I think the covenant agreements are more recognized between entities, landowners, than they are probably with anyone that's not a sovereign. The sovereign can do anything. It's almost like they start, they pick up that same thing that they got from about, from 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 um, that they got from the tower that these people become uh, uh, god kings, you know. And I think that's where the beginning of it is. You start to see that they don't they don't even worry about like this is a man's wife. Nobody even questioned that because it's going to the king. He's like our god. I just wanted to bring those two things up. I agree. And you know what? It it because this isn't that far. We we are within a 50, 60, 70 year range from the tower. Um there's people alive in the in Egypt at this time who were probably at the tower and seeing the language change and people start killing each other and couldn't function and couldn't understand each other and the, the whole spill out from that. So um to your point, it's definitely showing that the world hasn't learned anything from the tower. Like it immediately falls into whoredom as, as the world is spreading out into these places. And I don't look, I don't think it says that they ever prayed before they went down there. It looked like it just was like famine, everybody moving around. Maybe we heard it's still a little food in Egypt. He telling the people, say this is my sister, and we're gonna put her in this chest. Um, and as they just said, he wasn't even really confident in that. And just saying it's my sister. He's like, we gotta hide her. Which I don't also don't understand why she didn't just put on like a, a you know, like a burka type of thing and just completely cover up either. But maybe that wouldn't work either, you know. But um, I wanted to I wanted to add one more thing too, and that's about you know the whore that rides upon the beast. Mm -hmm. Like everything is like I think the way that I think about the kingdom and I think about what we're involved in is we're in a family, and we are the wife. And Yahushua is the husband, and he's coming to get us. Imagine if you've got a beautiful wife that's virtuous, the remnant is going to be virtuous, and it's going to be beautiful because of the righteousness that's been bestowed upon this woman from the, from the seed line. Whatever comes up, as far as righteous, righteousness is going to be the remnant. So Yahushua says, I tread the wine press alone. I'm coming, and I'm coming to get my woman. So that's the process of coming to get the righteous wife. Now, when you think about the whore that rides the beast, right, that's because the whole world has fallen, fallen into, you know, remember she says, I'm not, a, I'm, not a, I'm not a widow. So she's saying that I ain't marrying none of these, none of these players, mm -hmm. right? She's like, I'm not, what I'm going to waste my time marrying people for. I'm rich, I'm beautiful, and everybody drinks out of this cup. They do exactly what I tell them to do. So that's, that's the, the mindset of uh, uh of the adversary the adversary is like we can't we're going to go straight against marriage because remember over in the new testament it talks about uh or in the basura it talks about you know know that if you join your body with a harlot you you know you uh, you in that harlot are married you know unto death really you understand what i'm saying you under unto perdition mm -hmm. you know you become one flesh so when people are saying out here, oh, we, sex is marriage. Yes, sex is marriage unto hell. Mm. If, it's, if, it's, if it's not ordained by the most high, yes, you combine with that person and you're going, both of y'all are going to you sin against your body. And that fornication, that adultery marries you to perdition or hell or eternal punishment. And so that's what we're falling into. And that's what you see on social media. You know, no one has any shame about talking. I even heard somebody saying, well, you have sex with a woman on a menstrual cycle. And people, they, the guy was going around asking girls this, asking men this, and they, you know, and, and different women. And, you know, and people were saying yes. So I, I hold, and, and most of it was um, Judah, which is Sodom. When I say Judah, I'm talking about that, the so-called Negro that's in America. It has ancestors that are slaves. That's the ones that was being interviewed and talked about. I just wanted to bring that up, brother. Hallelujah. It this does speak to the way the world is, man. It really does. To sin against your own body. I think they did say it was one of the, I don't know if it was the worst, but it was one of the worst sins. 
is to sin against your own body. I think Paul says that in one of the Corinthians or something like that. But most definitely, they don't reverence marriage here, obviously. Um, because even though he said, say, this is my sister, um, they don't even ask. They just take her out the chest and they leave with her. I don't even think he ever even had the chance to say, this is my sister. But she did. They prayed once this happened. And it says, Yah hearkened to the voice of Sarah. And he sent an angel to deliver Sarah from the power of Pharaoh. And the king came and sat before Sarah. And behold, an angel of Yah was standing over them. And he appeared to Sarah and said to her, or to Sarah, and said to her, Do not fear, for Yahuwah has heard thy prayer. So she can see this angel. I thought this was interesting too. She can see this angel. But this Pharaoh can't. And she can hear the angel. He told her, don't fear. And the king approached Sarah and said to her, what is this? What is that man to thee who brought thee hither? And she said, he is my brother. This is the first time we've seen that act. And she told him, this is my brother. And this also goes back to me feeling like Pharaoh, Rekion, knew Abram. That's why he's asking, like, you know what? I remember him down in Babylon. I don't even know if he had no wife, though. But I know he went in that furnace. And he stood in there three days and three nights and didn't get burned. And the king said, it is incumbent upon us to make him great, to elevate him and to do unto him all the good which thou shalt command us. So if that's your brother and you came here with him, you know, it's incumbent upon us if I'm going to take you for a wife to make him great. And at that time, the king sent Abram silver, gold, precious stones in abundance. So he sent them a lot of wealth, which Pharaoh would have because he's making these people pay him to be buried. And people was complaining to the king, who was Osiris, it said, about that, right? Together with cattle, men, servants, and maid servants, and the king ordered Abram to be brought. And he sat in the court of the king's house, and the king greatly exalted Abram on that night. So the king, Rekion, is, is, is trying to do right by him as her brother. But this is his wife, and he... I think he actually got an idea. That's why he asked him, what is dude, what does he tell you? But, you know, full speed ahead. Like you said, with the whoredom of the land, she said it is whatever, no matter how I feel about it, it is what it is. 23 is saying, and the king approached to speak to Sarah, and he reached out his hand to touch her. When the angel smote him or hit him heavily, and he was terrified and he refrained from reaching to her. I always thought that was interesting, too. Any thoughts or comments on any of that that's exchanged between Sarah um, and this king slash pharaoh um, to start off? Anything jump out to y'all? Yeah, I was, uh, I hate to be the only one commenting, but I was uh, thinking about, uh, I think it's, uh, uh, I looked at uh, 1 Timothy 2.15. And but the woman will be saved through childbearing. One second, just and, uh, 15. Yeah, first first Timothy 2 15. Okay. And um, this is just something for us moving forward for our women. If no matter what's upon us and what we face, we're gonna face some craziness probably. But you know, know that the father is gonna protect you. You know, he's gonna protect you. Um it doesn't, you know, if you go in a, a bastion or in a land or in a place where it's all men and it's just that woman that righteous woman she's going to be protected mm. i just i just believe that you know because this is what we see our mother you know what i'm saying our mother sarah do you know she she went through this you know and um uh you know and it's the first thing she did is she went she she went straight to the father mm. and, and prayed you know what i'm saying and uh and, and i mean you talked a little bit earlier you know this, this is uh this is all because of the tradition that had been passed on it not this, not necessarily that Nahor, her father, or either Terah, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
Abraham's father knew it, but it was people beyond them that knew the truth that passed it on. And Abraham, you know, tried, the, you know, tried the truth and knew that it was it was good and became a friend of the Most High, you know. And um, I'm not Nahor. Nahor is not her brother, not her father. I can't think of um, of uh, uh, who uh, Nahor. Nahor is uh, is is Rivka's father. Yes. Oh man, um, Haran. Haran. Yeah. So not that even Haran or Terah knew. You know what I'm saying? They didn't even. They knew, but they weren't acting on. You know what I'm saying? They weren't really living up to it. But uh, you know, um, uh, you know, his sheep, his sheep know his voice. So Abraham was listening to the elders. It made sense. You know what I'm saying? Uh, beyond his 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 dad and his, his uncle. You know, hallelujah, hallelujah. You know what? This scripture, well, First Timothy two fifteen. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. And you know what, when you were just talking and I was reading this scripture, I was thinking, um, you think about our existence here in slavery, uh, the, the people who was oppressing us, the so-called master, these mini pharaohs, so to speak, um, we know it was a common thing for them to take slaves' wives and to rape them, send them back pregnant and to do all of that. Um, and we know that um, that's part of the punishment that's coming on this world because Yah did say we would go into servitude and you know you would always hear people say they further the affliction. He didn't tell them that that was okay to be, you know what I'm saying, raping the women and, 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 and in a lot of some cases, and maybe a lot also raping men, you know, and but impregnating the women and selling people off into slavery and splitting up families. Um, as you were talking, that just came to mind of what's happening here. And we see that Sarah prayed and Yah spared her, but there's so many of our people who, um, like I say, 150, 200 years ago and going back here during this transatlantic slave trade, and maybe even longer than that in some places, have went through this and were powerless. Mm -hmm. And these many pharaohs have taken um our grandparents and great 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 grandparents and 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 lived recklessly like this with them and this is part of the punishment that's coming on this world for doing those type of things mm -hmm. and you know i would like to make a distinction between sarah you know and uh, uh the women of israel during the time of yahushua 70 a.d and, and forward or really you know during the time of uh, uh you know after rehoboam and jeroboam we had already been warned over in Deuteronomy, you know, that this was going to befall us if we were, you know, to have other gods. So, you know, like when you're standing in righteousness, it's different than standing in iniquity. Mm. So, so, so like, you know, everybody has a chance to repent, but we didn't necessarily repent. I mean, none of the Northern Kings repented. I mean, they just didn't, they didn't, they didn't rock like that. They actually couldn't, re they didn't have the mind to repent because they had already set up, you know, a different place for the holy days, the feast days, to put different people in, in that office of priests that weren't supposed to be in there. And they just got divorced. And even us as the Southern Kingdom, we were still, you know, even just as crazy, like, you know, um, but the father just kept it because of the name of David, you know, because of, you know, because of his son, David. So. You know, all of this stuff is, is like, you know, that's a different type of person. That's the that's the child that you see that the father sees in the desert and they they have not been washed of blood and have not been salted. And he looks at the child and says, live. That's Sarah. Mm. That's is that's the original Israel. True. Now, 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 now this Israel that's being reborn now is Rebecca. This is the next level that's going to be married to Isaac, which is Yahusha. You see what I'm saying? So it's, it's he couldn't remarry us because he put us away, as you see in Jeremiah. He put us away, and then you see that you know um, uh, we were not a people, and uh, you know you see that in Hosea, and then we became a people again, and so it's a rebirth, and you see that act, act activated in the Valley of the Dry Bones. Mm. That's an activation prayer. It's an activation of the new wife that's going to come up. Probably. And so now that wife will not be suffering. That that wife is faced back to 
face like the second second chronicles chapter six that prayer of, of of solomon that wife that wife is doing that that's what we're doing we're that next wife because remember you know um when we go when whenever isaac gets Re Re rebecca he goes into sarah's tent sarah's dead right so sarah is the original israel now it's it's yahusha and israel which is rebecca it's us and yahusha but he hasn't consummated it yet but he's coming but we're getting ready as the five righteous virgins you know you know we're getting ready we're prepared for it you know so it's it's, it's a lot of stuff in these stories intertwined in these stories and this whole thing about you know the, you, the most high uh, preserving like like this you teach your daughters your womb is the is 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 the is the future of of, of Israel that's what it it's it cannot be defiled um, it must be it must be uh, wholly enjoined you know uh, to the flesh of uh, a kinsman you see what I'm saying so that's what has to happen. And that's what the father's awakening us to this understanding of what we just like, man, we don't need all this. We're going to do whatever everybody else is doing because we were already just so blessed in the land with everything going our way with the food and everything and prosperity. We're like, man, we don't need, we don't need to do all these feast days. And we were doing them. We weren't doing them. We weren't doing them with our full heart. And that's why he sent away with these feast days because y'all playing with me, mm. but we're not, we're not playing. See, like these people on this call, no matter where they're from, uh, or uh, Gentile or bloodborn, whatever. Ain't none of these people playing. And every last one of us were known before the foundation of earth. No matter what nation you come from, if you're in this, you were known before the foundation of the earth. It's not a play. It's not. It's not a joke anymore. This is real. You know. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And you know, you were correct. Um, the difference with us and during the transatlantic slave trade is exactly right. Sarah is still, um, for lack of a better word, will be considered pure. And he, he, like you said, it was already written before the foundation of the earth. And he's already telling Abraham that y'all gonna have these children. I'm gonna do this covenant through you. You know, with Isaac, all this is already set up. It's already etched in stone on the heavenly tablets, right? Um, so absolutely not. He could not uh, rape and do all that extra with Sarah. The difference with us in the transatlantic slave trade, um, and and really from seventy eight beyond, you're really right. It really started then the affliction of, or Jacob's trouble, if you want to call it that. Um, but um, I probably shouldn't even say it started then. But that's a that's a probably a a better date. Seventy AD is he had told us what would happen if we did things a certain way. And by the time we get to, which was unfortunate, the raping into our culture and all of that, um, we were in the curse and it was part of the punishment. And to be honest, I don't know if we could have properly, I don't know if we could have really repented out of that because it had to come to mm -hmm. pass once we, you know what I mean? Like once, mm -hmm. once our ancestors had did what they did, um, certain things just had to come to pass um mm -hmm. it had to the 400 year affliction and and um i won't say that the raping had to come to pass but the father you know and we've been reading joel on the shabbat and joel kind of speaks to that um and, and as i've been reading these prophets going forward for the to to to, to y'all will and read it with the family um mm -hmm. certain things had to happen uh, so that when Yah punishes this world for what it's done to his heritage, as he's going to say in Joel in the next few mm -hmm. chapters, um, it's um, it's 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 a righteous punishment mm -hmm. for the things that's been done. But you are right; that's why our ancestors more closer to where we are now had to go through that and not Sarah, because the curses mm -hmm. were afoot, and um, it was prophesied what it would be. And we were living in um, that time, and and it's not it's not really written in, in world history. Uh, the hundred and twenty years uh, from the from the from the foundation of uh, from the notification of of uh, of uh, uh, Samuel identifying uh, Saul until the death of uh, Solomon. That's one hundred and twenty years. Mm -hmm. 
we were the we were the world power. Yes. So you don't you don't see you don't see Daniel's statue come until we get after after we pass Jeroboam and Rehoboam. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is is correct. So like David was such a man. David was such a prophet, right? He already, I mean, he put us he put our alphabet inside of Psalms one nineteen. You know, he told us in chapter two, why did the heathen reign? He told us the game plan of um, of going back and just meditating on the scripture and understanding Balaam and Balak. He understood, he put that together in the, through the Ruach in Psalms 83. And so it, it, was, it, was, it was just a matter of time before Psalms 83 would be fulfilled. And when Psalms 83 is fulfilled, you know, there goes this, there goes the vision of Daniel and, and the statue of uh, the statue of, of, of Babylon. Mm -hmm. And then as you said, it has to go through. You know, everything the father decrees it. And um and that's what Zedekiah and them didn't really quite understand. You know, he can decree you to go in captivity, but he can make your captivity kind of uh nice. Yeah. If you if you agree with it. But Zedekiah didn't believe that because he listened to his princes and stuff and they were just tripping, you know. But you know, <laughs> having said all having said all that, this is like all of this stuff had to come. Once he gave these four kingdoms, man, we were in, it's a mess then, man. Whew, it was a hot mess. Once he laid those four kingdoms out, we still under Rome at the V. You know, hallelujah. No, true. That's a good, that's a good way to look at it. And we see Sarah's is, is a good example of um, when we are in right standing with Yah, the blessing. Like as it says in 23, and the king approached to speak to Sarah. And he reached out his hand to touch her when the angel smote him heavily and he was terrified and he refrained from reaching to her. And I'm sure, I'm also sure that during um, those times of a couple hundred years ago when one of the raping into our bloodlines was going on, right? I'm also sure that knowing the mercy of our Elohim that there was some slaves that was on point and that was praying and was repenting and it was some slave masters who was probably also smote in those moments too, you know, but by and large as a nation of people, um, we were on the other side of the curses. And, and as I see our DJ put in the chat, it was spoken. Certain things had to be fulfilled. Um, but Yah comes back and he's like, nah, you furthered the affliction. No, I didn't say you could do all that, but I allowed you to do that though. Because now when I come to punish you with this righteous punishment, Nobody will be able to say that they weren't worthy for what's coming unto the world. And, and that's where we're at, Joe, where it gets to talking about that day of Yah, um, which is up on us. Um, which is up on us, honestly. Verse 23, verse 24 says, and when the king came near to Sarah the second time, the angel smote him to the ground. So this angel hit him. He fell to the ground the second time, which had to be an amazing scene, right? It's saying, acted thus to him the whole night. And the king was terrified. Verse 25, and the angel on that night smote heavily all the servants of the king and his whole household on account of Sarai. And there was a great lamentation that night amongst the people of Pharaoh's house. So we see that and and I I'm sure I'm sure during during when slavery was more active, um, I'm sure that they were there was some descendants of ours who were praying and were repenting and 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 uh, Yah showed them favor and I'm sure that there was some slave owners whose houses were smoked, um, trying to do that recklessness and raping into the bloodline as well. And Sarah is the example of how this goes, as you say that we'll be protected as even as Obadiah prayed earlier about the protection of Yah. Um, Sarah and Abraham is an example of how this is going to go when we are on the right side of obedience. Um, the way they're giving him all these gifts and sending him out of Egypt. We know he told him in Genesis 15 with the covenant, they're going to give your people a bunch of gifts and send them out of bondage and captivity too. So um, the, they are representing um, the right side of obedience, I will say. Uh -huh. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they represent. <laughs> I, I agree. They're representing um, that in this moment and in all of the moments of their lives, actually. You know, you know, I was just thinking about what you're saying. There's some people that were, that were like righteous all along. We've, there's been a strand of us, you know, sprinkled down through the time. And this, this verse, this verse 11, 16 says, I will provide a little sanctuary. And then I also think about people that did the right thing and that they, um, that they, that they uh, got a covenant of peace for their family for the rest of their generations. And that was Phinehas who went in and killed the, the, the fornicators, you know, so his descendants, which he was a priest, his descendants somewhere in the mix of us, wherever we are, they have been they've been people that have uh, uh, recognized pre- peace mm-hmm. in their family. True. They actually got peace in their family. <laughs> they got, they don't have no blockage of understanding the scripture. They probably don't have no hesitation for standing up for righteousness. It's just a covenant of peace that the father then gave them. That's some real heavy shalom. Those are the miracles. Those are the true blessings from Yahweh. You can block your family into uh, the book of life like that. You know, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Ezekiel eleven sixteen says, therefore say, thus saith the most high Yah, although I have cast them far off among the heathen, and although I have scattered them among the countries, yet will I be to them as a little sanctuary in the countries where they shall come. And like I say, not as a nation, we see that today, not as a nation, but yeah, I do believe there's always been a remnant who's been trying to hold true. And you just think about our lives today. Um, with things going on all around us and, and some closer than others. Um, the father is still providing a little sanctuary to us in the places we are. He's still providing um, little Goshen's and some semblance of Shalom mm-hmm. amongst all of this crazy. So we also see that to, um, today. I agree Hallelujah. with the scripture right there. Hallelujah. Most definitely. Any other questions or comments about this interaction between Sarah and this Pharaoh slash king so far? All right. Hallelujah, verse 26. Would anybody like to pick up reading here at verse 26? Hallelujah. Sarah is representation of how it's supposed to be, how it's going to be. Um, as we are getting, and Sarah was a righteous woman, same with Abram. So as we're getting our righteousness together, um, this is a good example of the um, the blessing of obedience. Um, I didn't think of that earlier, but that is exactly what this story is, just showing you the blessings of obedience. Verse 26 say, and Pharaoh seeing the evil that befell him said, surely on account of this woman has this thing happened to me. So this Pharaoh is recognizing that, like I'm saying, this Pharaoh could be the king also as well. And they're already calling Osiris, which was the king of Egypt at the time when Rekion was here in last chapter. But um, this could be Rekion also. Um, and it's saying, if Pharaoh seeing the evil that befell him said, surely on account of this woman has this thing happened to me. And he removed himself at some distance from her and spoke pleasing words to her. So this Pharaoh, which I, I still believe could be Rekion, but it could also be the actual king. And even if it is Osiris, the actual king, we know that Rekion, who they're calling Pharaoh at this time, has been appointed or anointed or exalted up into second in command of all of Egypt. And it said that he would rule the people until that day of the year when the Pharaoh, when the king would come. And um judging all matters of all the affairs of Egypt, which is weird to me that, you know, at this time you're only coming around one day in a year. But with that being said, even if this is the Osiris, who is the king, um, even when they bring this woman and all this go on, he would have consulted Pharaoh. A, these people coming from where you coming from, and B, you know, you're my top counselor, magician, advisor, whatever. You know what I mean? So he would have consulted him about these matters. He would have, he's in the loop of this somehow, some way is, is what I'm trying to get to. But this Pharaoh, it said, and he realized it like, what's going on here in my house? You know, there's all this weirdness happening to me. People in the house complaining all night and crying and women feeling crazy. And these people, you know, 
y'all done probably brought a plague through the house. Everybody got a fever and throwing up or whatever the case may be. He recognizes it though. Like this, I, we was all doing good yesterday. Only thing that changes here is this woman done been brought to me. So it said he removed himself at a distance and spoke pleasing words to her. Verse 27. And the king said to Sarai, tell me, I pray thee, concerning the man with whom thou came here. Sarah said, excuse me, this man is my husband. And I said to thee that he was my brother, for I was afraid lest thou should put him to death through wickedness. So now she tells him the truth. And the king probably like, wow, no wonder this was going on. This really her husband. And the king kept away from Sarah, and the plagues of the angel of Yah ceased from him and his household. And Pharaoh knew that he was smitting on account of Sarah. And the king was greatly astonished at this. So he was like, wow. Um, you know, he had never seen nothing like it to where not only him, but his whole household. Mind you, in this household, he, if this is the king and not Rekion, you know, he got why a wife, maybe wives, children, many servants. There was a lot of people who were smitten in here on account of this. And like I say, he would have consulted Rekion on this. And even if this wasn't Rekion, when he consulted him on this, Rekion would have told him then, oh, that's Abram from Babylon. I was just seeing Nimrod try to do the same thing. And this man walked in fire for three days, three nights. All of even if Rekia went there, it said that all of Babylon was there. So he knew that story. It's, it's, it's like impossible not to. So just trying to draw a line from the Tower of Babel, Nimrod, Babylon to this. And we see that Yah is, as we know, Yah does everything for the glory. Like even the fall of Egypt the first time, he used Moses and our people so that the world could see the glory of Yah. The same reason why he's using us now in the end, so that the world can see the glory of Yah. That's why we decrease as he increases, because all of this is so that the glory of Yah can be seen, right? And we just see a pattern from the tower to this, to Abram in the furnace, the way he left Babylon, to this, and we're going to see it go forward when Lot's taken and Sodom, when um. And all the things that Abram do, that Yah's using Abram so that he can get the glory, right? So in this moment, Yah's getting the glory once again. It's like they have an Elohim that fights for them. And in the morning, the king called for Abram and said to him, what is this thou hast done to me? Why did thou say she is my sister, owing to which I took her unto me for a wife? And this heavy plague has therefore come upon me and my household. Why did you lie? Why did you lie? Now, therefore, here is thy wife. Take her and go from our land, lest we all die on her account. Now y'all got to go. And Pharaoh took more cattle, men servants and maid servants, and silver and gold to give Abram. And he returned unto him, Sarah, his wife. So now we seen Babylon do this. And now, um, and mind you, Lot is with Abraham or Abram during all this too. So Babylon did it, now the Egyptians did it. So now Abram, who is already fair, he got Abram got to be decent because he got four hundred close to 400 servants with him. So they ain't moving around poor, first off. But now... And remember, when he took her as the wife, it said he gave him gold and silver and precious stones. Now he gave him more cattle, men servants, maid servants, more silver and gold. Abram is like extremely rich after this. Like he's went from doing okay, you know, enough to take care of all these people with me. Yah's blessing me to he's extremely wealthy. He has to have a lot of cattle. And we see that when we go up further with him and Lot getting into it about this cattle. They both did. Abram's got so much. Lot has a lot, right? It says, and the king took a maiden whom he beget by his concubine, by his concubines. And he gave her to Sarah for a handmaid. 
And the king said to his daughter, it is better for thee, my daughter, to be a handmaid in this man's house than to be a mistress in my house after we have beheld the evil that befell us on account of this woman. And see, now that's where it will speak to, maybe this is King Osiris's child. But on the same token, this could have been a one, two-year-old baby or something that he sent with them. Um, he sent May servants, so her nurse could have been with them. And we know that Sarah raised um, we know we know that Abram didn't sleep with her right away. Sarah is going to raise her in the ways of Yah, because we know in in as we move forward in Genesis, when it comes to Hagar, which is that 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 made that um child's name, I'm assuming. Um, but we know that when we get to that point, it says that. Uh, Sarah, Abram's wife, bear him no children, and she had an handmaid, an Egyptian whose name was Hagar, right? And and uh, it says, and Sarah's and Sarah and Abram's wife, and Sarah Abram's wife took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband Abram. And he went on to her. Uh, what does it say, man? Oh, you know what I think it says is in Joshua when we get there. But it speaks to how Sarah had raised Hagar in truth. But being that they were here 10 years, I'm not sure. I'm going to assume that it was probably 10 years after this. So that would mean that this Pharaoh was more than likely Osiris himself, the king. And that this was one of his offspring from one of his concubines and she probably was already 10 15 years old or something like that when he sent her that that would that would make me believe that but when we get there and jasher is going to speak about how hagar having been with them she wasn't still in there and worshiping all these other gods and doing the things of egypt it's going to speak to how being in the house of fun the handmaid of sarah Sarah had raised her in the ways of Yah, and she was, um, I don't even know if the word is faithful, but she wasn't ignorant to the ways of Yah and being in Abra under Abraham's tent. She was living in that way up under Sarah, but that would speak to this king actually being Osiris, and he's probably just consulting Rekion on this matter, right? It says in the king, okay, he told his daughter that you it's better for you to be with them than with me, um, which was smart of him. It's better for you to go learn the ways of Yah up under them. And it worked out because her offspring went on to be a great nation, as Yah is going to tell Hagar when she has Ishmael. Basically, this might not be the son of the covenant, but he's going to go on to be a great nation as well. Um, and Ishmael was blessed uh, when 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 Yah comes and tells Abram and all of them to circumcise themselves, Ishmael was there and he was circumcised too. Um, Ishmael, the actual son, it's a good chance he was following the ways of Yah because he was obedient to his father. Um, it's his children that uh, may have strayed, which we see that with all of the lineage of Abraham, right? Lot was more than likely following the ways of Yah. His children strayed. Um, Maybe not Esau. Esau kind of was just like he ain't wanting to do with it from the beginning. But Ishmael as well. Um, when I was talking to you, came y'all earlier. We talked about Jethro them and the Midianites. They were following the ways of Yah. But when we get to Judges, they were afflicting Israel, which was their cousins. Um, so we see that through these through the lineage of um Abram. Like I said, many nations would be blessed, but a lot of those men who started those certain nations, their children, when you get further away from them in scripture, they stray. Um, but Ishmael, um, you know, I'm not saying that he was perfect, but he knew the ways of Yah. He was taught, he was taught in them by Abram. Verse 33, and Abram arose, and he and all belonging to him went away from Egypt. And Pharaoh ordered some of his men to accompany him and all that went with him. So not that Abram's left really rich, 
Pharaoh didn't also went as far. And you know what? They may be, you know, that word king, they may be, Pharaoh may be recognizing the king is actually Osiris. I don't know. And he's just working that closely with him. But I find it interesting that they capitalize on the Pharaoh, but they're not capitalizing the king here, almost like it's talking about, it could be talking about two different people too. But it says, and Abram rose and he and all belonging to him went away from Egypt. And Pharaoh ordered some of his men to accompany him and all that went with him. So he done left so rich. Now Pharaoh basically sent, um, I don't know, I guess you would consider these some mighty men of Egypt. Like y'all, y'all go not only y'all make sure y'all protect him until he all the way away from here. We don't want nothing to happen to him while he's nowhere near here because of what just went on. Um, and at least he this this pharaoh slash king is smart enough to know. Um, we don't want we don't want to get on the wrong side of whatever's protecting them. Um, and probably the gods, you know how they would talk. Their god or the gods are protect whatever the case may be, how they framing it. But we don't i'm not messing with them and i don't want nothing to happen to, to happen to them while they're on egyptian soil it says and abram returned to the land of canaan to the place where he had made the altar where he at first where he at first pitched his tent and it was famine in canaan that's why he down in egypt but you know he going back he got a lot of cattle i mean i guess he good And Lot, the son of Haran, and now we get to Lot. And Lot, the son of Haran, which is why I believe Sarah and Lot are brother and sister. Abram's brother had a heavy stock of cattle. So even Lot, from being with Abram and all these things going on, he's been blessed too. Said he had a heavy stock of cattle, flocks. And herds and tents, for Yah was bountiful to them on account of Abram. So not only Lot, these servants and all these people that's with Abram, like, there's quite a few people around him who done got rich um, or who's been blessed as Yah is blessing Abram's house 30, 60, 100 fold. Um, because it's not, Abram doesn't have slaves. He has people who didn't watch what didn't happen to him in these places he didn't win. And they'd be like, we want to go with you and learn your ways. And Abram like, cool. You know, you got to come hold up your own end and you got to learn the ways and we following y'all, but cool. And from being with him um, and him having his household in order, you know, and no lot of disorder in his household, the father isn't only blessing Abram, he's blessing everybody around him. It says, and when Abram was dwelling in the land of the herdsmen of Lot. When Abram was dwelling in the land, the herdsmen of Lot quarreled with the herdsmen of Abram. But their property was too great for them to remain together in the land. And the land could not bear them on account of their cattle. So it should have. The land that they got on where they were at before as they come back from Egypt, it ain't big enough. And Lot ain't smart enough to get his compromise right. He, he, you know, he's young, he's doing it however he want to do, which he probably ain't that much younger than Abram, though. So true. If Sarah's 10 years, he's probably in range of that as well. <coughs> it says their property was too great for them to remain together in the land and the land cannot bear them on account of their cattle verse 37 and when abram's herdsmen went to feed their flock they would not go into the fields of the people of the land out of respect these people respecting us here this the land we got feed my feed feed the flock within this land no matter how big it is but don't be in nobody else land doing that out of respect being decent and in order is what Abram's being right here. It says, but the cattle of Lot's herdsmen did otherwise. The cattle of Lot's herdsmen did otherwise. But they were suffered to feed in the fields of the people of the land. So Lot, 
people with him, his cattle. They like, man, it ain't enough land. We got to go over here and feed the other people. You know, it's a famine up there and all that. These other people probably, I don't want to say they poor, but they probably ain't got it like them. And I could just hear lots of herdsmen like, man, they not even using all that land, man. They don't mind. <laughs> But they were suffered to feed in the fields of the people land, of the people of the land, which is the Canaanites. And the people of the land saw this occurrence daily. And they came to Abram and quarreled with him on account of Lot. So they come to Abram, they like, your nephew, man. He down here doing this and doing that. Um, you know, we honor you, Abram. We, you know, ain't nobody got a problem with you. We tell them to show some respect, man. We got our, our little cattle too or whatever. We might not have as much as you, but still, I have to tell him to show some respect. And Abram liked that. He like, yeah, you're right. That ain't our land. And I don't know why he over there. I'm telling mine to stay over here. Um, he ain't got no business doing it like that. You know, Abram, a righteous man. He's not going to, uh, you know, Abram is representing the father on the planet at this time, right? He is establishing the covenant through the father as made through him. Um, He's representing the father as far as getting his household in order. You're gonna we we we're gonna see that as we go through with the circumcision and all of that. Um, the same way Moshe was called to represent the father, and as you came, I said earlier, Abram is representing the father. Sarah is representing Israel, right? Just like Isaac is going to represent Yahushua, and Rebecca is representing the regathering of Israel, right? So. Be, I say that to say that we know the father does not have respect to persons. It's always about doing what's right, no matter what. Um, righteousness, justice, truth. The same characters of our father, merciful and long-suffering and all that as well. Abram is representation of that. So that's also why these other people knew to go to him. Like, because they probably was quarreling with Lotta already, man. Lot, get your people, man. Woo, woo. They probably done threw hands in the field somewhere already because Lot is being is unruly. But they respected Abram and they like, we can go to Abram, man. We don't got to go through this and he'll holler at him. And Abram, as we see in verse 39, Abram, like, and Abram said to Lot, What is this thou art doing to me to make me despicable? That's a strong word for him to use. What are you doing? You, you making me despicable to the inhabitants of the land that thou order thy herdsmen to feed thy cattle in the fields of other people. Like, dude, uh, they loving us up here. What is you doing? <laughs> hey, they loving us out here a lot. What is you doing? You messing up the love. We chilling. We rich. Yah done blessed us abundantly is how he would have said it. He wouldn't looked at it like he was rich. He would have been on Yah's blessed me abundantly blessed you, blessed all these other people with us. Um, all these other servants and stuff with us is people from Babylon and strangers and other people coming amongst us. You family. You the one person here that everybody knows is family. And look how you making us look. Which is how I usually go to when you think about it. When you be in the spot or something, right? You be at a, you on a job or you in some place of authority, you to work really hard to get some position and everybody on the job, they respect you and you hold it down. Soon as you hire a brother or a cousin or even a really close friend, somebody close to you get there who know you, they be the one in the office living every which way. <laughs> and now you got to be playing them like, bro, everything was running smooth. I'm bigging you up like you my, my nephew and I got you in here. And you got us looking like we living like any old kind of people, which which understand. Abram's been raised under Noah and Shem, knowing the ways of Yah. He ain't feeling that. You got to represent this a certain way because you're not just representing me. We re Abram takes serious that we representing Yah. I'm representing um, not only Tara, people know what he was on, but Mind you, Abram's story is known. I'm representing Shem. I'm representing Noah. Keep in mind, we're not that far from the tower. Noah just died, right? Everybody on the planet, even though these languages and all that's been changed, 
everybody on the planet, and we know this from when you look at the history of these cultures on the planet today, almost all these cultures have a flood story. Why? Because even though everything done changed, it's a tower and all of that, everybody knows Noah. Like everybody on the planet knows there is not one, in my opinion, at this time and really still even today. When you really think about it today and when you think of any biblical figure, the Messiah aside, if don't nobody of all these cultures know nothing, you didn't heard the story of the flood and, and Noah. That's probably the second most popular story in the Bible. The first being the Gospels and the life of the Messiah. But the second most popular story in what we call the Bible is the story of Noah and the flood. Even today, I would say, and, and some of you may see that differently, but I would say that is my opinion today. So going back 2,500 years ago, or really 4,000 years ago, 4,500, maybe 42 or something to get to this time that they're in here, without question, the most popular story on the planet, even with the tower. And all because everybody, even though it was a lot of people there, everybody wasn't at the tower. You still had a lot of people who was with Noah. Even with the tower, the most popular story on the planet still at this time would be the flood story in Noah. So Abram is representing having everything that went on with him in Babylon. Nimrod and them tried to kill him at birth. Terror done hit him. He was up with Shem and Noah. Abram's story is known as well. So he's looking at Lot like, yo, not only is you family and you disrespecting me and you making me and Terror and our household look bad, I'm representing Shem, Noah, Yah, right? Because we've been establishing through this that Nimrod's battle with the tower and all that was with Yah, no question. But it wasn't necessarily with Yah. It was with Noah who was representing the word of Yah, the Melchizedek priesthood, if you want to look at it like that, on the planet. Nimrod's battle was really with Noah. Oh, you want to go up there with Noah and learn all that mumbo jumbo and him sit up, talk about the flood all day and what it was pre-flood. And we here now. We got our own thing. We creating our own gods. We creating our own ways. We even got a tower. We're going to build it this high. If he flood again, we're going to be in the top of the tower. We'll be good, as the scriptures say, so that we could get our own name. We're going to do it our own way. His, the way he was selling it to the people, which were the Hamites, Yephites, and the Shemitic people that were there, that's how Nimrod selling it. You could go follow all that nonsense Noah talking about. You could follow me. So when Abraham's here and these people's talking, that's what he's thinking. Like, man, you disrespecting me. You disrespecting Shem. You disrespecting Noah. Most importantly, you disrespecting the teachings I done got from them for, about Yah. Because in those teachings, we ain't no respect to persons. We do everything decent and in order, right? Uh, what am I missing? We long suffering and kind and merciful and forgiving. And you wilding. And out of all these people with me, the people is like your nephew is the one who be wilding. And that has to be hurting, Abram. My daughter took you in. Your daddy done died with me in the furnace. Like, it's been real. That story's known. Everybody, the people, especially these 300 servants that left with us from Babylon, they all know. Man, nephew with him because his daddy went into the furnace with him and his heart wasn't right with Yah and he died in there with Abram as Abram walked around for three days. So Abram's probably been compelled because y'all told Abram, leave your family. Y'all told Abram, leave your family. Lot, you really ain't even supposed to be with me. I'd have left Tara and our, my brother, your uncle Nahor. I done went out my way to keep you with me. Y'all told me, leave all y'all. Leave with me and Sarah and build this thing up. And of all the people, which is probably why he acting like that too, because y'all told him, even though it seems cruel, but y'all told him, leave your family. He didn't say Lot. Y'all told him, you and Sarah. He didn't say, just like he didn't say Terah, he didn't say Lot. And Abram's thinking about all that. I done got you rich, which it ain't been me, but from you being with me, you know what I'm saying? And that's how you do me. You got the people over here mad at me 
because you ain't listening to me. Just to set that same, that has to be blowing Abram. Like, man, wow, really? That's what I expect from the servants, Eliezer them, <laughs> who them ride them the game. Y'all expect that from them, Lot. What are you doing? It says, doest thou not know that I am a stranger in this land amongst the children of Canaan? And why wilt thou do this unto me? You disrespecting a lot of stuff. You disrespecting. And even though my daddy was tripping, Abram still respect his daddy. That's his daddy. You disrespecting Terry. You disrespecting your daddy, Haram, my brother who did die. Most importantly, you disrespecting the teachers that I didn't got from Shem, from Noah, the ways of Yah. You disrespecting all of that when you're doing what you're doing because it's not decent and in order. And we wasn't, y'all know how y'all people be talking to you. I can hear it. We wasn't raised like that a lot. You know, of everybody with me, like you and Sarah know better. You supposed to know better. And said, and Abram quarreled daily with Lot. So he, Lot done got disrespectful. Now Lot, <laughs> it's bad enough. Unc done had to tell you once and said, they quarreling daily. So Lot now done just got on. I'm going to do what I want to do. Unc tripping. Which y'all knowing that be, the being from the beginning is probably why he told Abram in the beginning, you and Sarah. You didn't, you didn't slightly went against me even taking Lot. I didn't tell you Lot. I told you, you and Sarah. Had you not took Lot, he would be with Nahor, they still be straight. But you wouldn't be going through this. He quarreled daily with Lot on account of this. But Lot would not listen to Abram and he continued to do the same and the inhabitants of the land came and told Abram. So you know it's getting tense now. You know it's getting tense now. The people like, Abram, we love you, but if your nephew don't get right, bro, you're going to have to move. Are we going to have a problem? The people probably a little jealous. Like, like y'all said, it was famine in the land. They probably struggling. Abram, Abram was already decent. He didn't went to Egypt. They didn't bless him with all kind of stuff. He, 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 you know, it ain't hard to tell. And not only him, they done blessed all the servants and the people with him with all kind of stuff. So everybody around him looking nice. But these Canaanites who are in the land with this famine, they probably not looking that nice. They probably not looking that nice. People starving. You know, with the cattle and the flocks come the good furs and the best sandals. You know what I'm saying? They put together. And these people probably like, yo, now it's probably tense. Like, dude, no, y'all, you, you disrespected us. And then Abram, he thinking like, man, I'm arguing a lot every day. I should have listened to y'all. Y'all told me just me and Sarah. Look how that went. And that go, that's a, I think that's a lesson too. Even in the slightest disobedience, it never ends well. In the slightest of disobedience, right? Because Abraham's a righteous man, so you know he's thinking about it. Like, y'all told me just me and Sarah. I done went out my way to take Lot. I feel responsible a little bit because his daddy died with me. And he tripping. He disrespectful. He don't want to listen. As I said, Lot would not listen. And they quarreling daily. So these arguments probably getting intense, which now everybody's standing around who looking, they probably thinking like, wow, you know how the service thinking. I would never talk to Abram like that. And they looking at Lot like his nephew be bugging. You know it. And he continued to do the same. And the inhabitants of the land came and told Abram. So now that exchange getting intense. Verse 41. And Abram said unto Lot, How long wilt thou be to me for a stumbling block with the inhabitants of the land? Y'all know that had to take a lot. That was some strong language. How long are you going to keep playing around down here? Now I beseech thee, let there be no more quarrel in between us. You know what, nephew? I love you, man. I don't want to be arguing with you like this every day. Let it be no more quarreling between us because we are kinsmen and I love you. You my nephew. But I pray, really, but I'm going to plead with you. It's time for us to separate. You need to go your own way. No, that was tough. I love, uh, Abram love Lot. And on, and on top of that, Abram knowing Lot hard-headed, really don't listen. And all the stuff about him that a true elder of the family and uh, he knowing like, man, dude might be the did anything when he get from with me, but he got to go from with me because he making it hectic right here where we at. 
Abram know, you know, you know your people. You know your people. Abram knowing. And the reason why I know is because that's why he finna tell him, don't worry about where you at, anything happened, I got you. Because he knows something gonna happen. You already hard headed. I know you don't listen. I know you, I knew your daddy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He already knowing that. That's why he don't want to do it though, because he loves his nephew. I pray thee, separate from me, go and choose a place where thou mayest dwell with thy cattle and all belonging to thee. Go find you a spot to be, but keep thyself at a distance from me, thou and thy household. You need to go find you another plot. Stay at a distance and thy household. I, I, I don't know if he's already married and got children, but he got servants and all that as well. He's, he's pretty thick too. But this 43 is how I know he already thinking like you, are, you, are, you a mess up though. I know how you get you. Y'all know how we think, man, dude. Dude just can't get right. I know wherever he go, he going to get to tripping and ain't no telling what he going to be he got himself into. And he know that. That's why he told him verse 43, be not afraid and going from me. For if anyone do any injury to thee, let me know. And I will avenge thy cause from him. Only remove from me. And that's how, I, and that, when I read that, I was like, that was Abram letting us know, man, I know my nephew be tripping, man. Ain't no telling what he going to go get himself into. But because I do love him, I'm going to make sure he know. No matter what happened, you just make sure you get word to me and I'm going to come make sure you straight. And remember, Lot know. Everybody with them really know, but Lot especially know. Like, man, they tried to kill Uncle Bert. He know Yah's with Abram. You know, Abram is, is I don't want to say he's untouchable, but you know, like I say, he's, 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 like Moses was to Israel or like Noah would have had been to everybody. He's God-like, you know what I mean? Like it's known that he's blessed by Yah. Everybody, not everybody in Egypt know not like, man, he was down here with his wife, had her head in the chest and we took her and look at what happened to Pharaoh and the whole house was struggling. Like he's a, he's a, he's a God-like figure everywhere he go. Everybody know, the Babylonians know. The Egyptians know, and them probably the two biggest slots so far. Everybody know the words around like this dude is blessed. And that's why he telling Lot, man, Lot, you know y'all got us, man. I'm going to be praying for you. Don't, don't worry. You had no fear. You straight. Anything happen, I'm coming. And when Abram had spoken all these words to Lot, then Lot arose and lifted up his eyes towards the plain of Jordan. And he saw that the whole of this place was well watered and good for man as well as affording pasture for the cattle. And Lot went from Abram to that place and he there pitched his tent and he dwelt in Sodom and they were separated from each other. So he moves to Sodom, of which Sodom is already known. Sodom is already known for being a little reckless, right? So when he tell Abram he going to Sodom, Abram probably knew right then, like, that figures he would go down there amongst these reckless Hamites. Because we figured out from a few chapters back when it broke down the lineage in this, it gave a more detailed breakdown. And it said the people of Sodom and Gomorrah were Hamites, which speaks to the lawlessness of it. That's why he was looking at Egypt like that. But not only that, we know that Noah, when he separated these lands up, when y'all told him to tell Yafeb, go here, Ham, go here, and Shem, go there. Sodom and Gomorrah is some Hamites just like some Canaanites who took some land that wasn't given to them. Just like Nimrod, where Babylon and all that was was some land that wasn't given to them. Right? Looked like the Hamites was just standing on that. We, ain't, we don't care what he gave Shem. We want this land for Shem. It's plush. But not only that, something else I noticed here. It always say, man, um, what's the term? Everything that glitter ain't gold. Or you know, the 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 where we probably don't want to be always looks better than where we at, you know, or uh you got the wide path that looks all nice and glamorous, but that's the way that leads you to calamity. And a narrow path may not look as all nice and as glamorous, but that's the one that's gonna lead you to the kingdom. You know what I mean? It says that Lot and he saw that the whole place was well watered. Sodom, he looking over towards the Jordan. He like, it looked well water, good for man. It was pleasing to the eye. 
kind of like the tree of life or the tree of knowledge and good and evil, right? With, 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 with Eve, it said that the tree was pleasing to the eye. But anyway, it ain't where you want to be. And mind you, ain't no secrets. They know what's going on in Sodom. That word around. We know that from the way that Abram was talking about Egypt, man. Elohim ain't in this place. Same difference. He pitched his tent, he dwelt in Sodom, and they were separated from each other. And Abram knew right then, like this boy, yeah, I'm going to probably have to go check for him. And as we read further, we're going to see he's going to send Eliezer down there to check for him before Sodom falls. Um, Abram probably always was sending servants to Sodom, like, go check down there a lot, because he loved him like that. And he knew that stuff. He knew it was reckless. And not only that, he knew Lot was easily swayed into being reckless. We see that. But they say they were separated. Verse 47, and Abram dwelt in the land of Mamre where he was at for the longest, which is Hebron. That's important because if I'm not mistaken, when they anoint King David, it's in Hebron. Um, I think Hebron, when Israel comes through, is one of those sanctuary cities where if it was a, a unfortunate death or something until you got a trial, you could go there and could nobody kill you until it was like a trial or the elders or whatever came together. Um, and I'm sure some of you got some stories about Hebron too, because Hebron is a very is a is a place that's spoken of a lot in Torah. But Abram dwelt in the plain of he of Mamre, which is in Hebron. I believe the cave of Machpelah, whatever, is in Hebron, where Abram and Sarah. I don't know Sarah there. I don't know Sarah might have died in the road. No, Sarah's there, I think. But I know Yet Jacob's there, Yitzhak's there. That's where they were buried. You know, Hebron is, a, is an important place in the history of an Israelite. And Abram dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron. And he pitched his tent there, and Abram remained in that place many years. So where Abram's at, Yah sustained him there for many years. And it, and it don't say how long this famine lasted, but we see now that and being that Sodom was well watered, some of the Canaanites might have went to Sodom as well. Um, some of the Canaanites might have went that way instead of going to Egypt. They might have went and dwelt in Sodom because it was somewhere else that, you know, was holding it together during their famine. Um, that's something to think about as well. But any questions or comments on any of that we read tonight with Lot? With Sarah and Egypt, or any of these things. Hallelujah. That's the end of chapter 15. <sighs> yeah, yeah, that's um that's a pretty, pretty a lot of stuff to think about in that, you know. Uh, I was thinking about Sarah and, and Abraham leaving Egypt with great wealth, of course, you know. Uh that you know, um the 12 sons will leave leave Egypt with great wealth. So we see that, mm -hmm. and then uh, you know um, <laughs> this whole thing with uh, with with uh, you. So you know this is reaping and sowing. That's our kingdom. That's what really the the, the universe is built off of, as far as man goes. What mm -hmm. you what you sow, you reap. So we see that uh, you know um, a lot leaves. He leaves. Uh, he leaves um, Sodom, and his wife dies, and he he doesn't have any wealth, and he just has his two daughters. Mm -hmm doesn't have anything and you know and then you don't see the come up of him anymore you mm -hmm. know we've been in a we've, we've been in studies i don't know if obadiah has been in a study with you know a goshen where we talked about that a little bit more but he didn't have nothing after he left true you know what i'm saying you know it's just um it's all it's all just a a cycle you know and just like you said eliezer going down there to see him and eliezer is the uh, is the angel of the presence you know, if you look at Abraham being Yah, Sarah being Israel, and Eleazar is that angel that's, you know, not only going to check on Lot, but also going to get the the wife for Isaac, mm, you know. True. true. So, so, so it gathers the wife and it prayerful to the Most High, you know, about, you know, only doing what the Most High tells them to do. You see what I'm saying? If they don't want to let her go, leave her. Don't, 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 don't take her. You know what I'm saying? So, all of these things are just putting together um, 
you know, um, and this is, I, I really think about, you know, the 10 words when I think about this, the 10 commandments, honor your father and your mother. You honor your father and your mother, which these are our fathers and our mothers by knowing about them. Mm. How, how, how can you honor someone if you don't really know what they did? True. And, you know, even uh, uh, Noah's wife and Noah are our father and our mother. We know that Adam and Eve are our father and our mother. Mm -hmm. You see, you know, see what I'm saying? So, yeah, hallelujah. No, hallelujah, you're right. And you know what? You just made me think. I didn't even think about how Sarah was looking at this. Lot, her brother, they done lost their father. Um, she probably super salty at the way Lot playing Abram and he got to leave from around. <gasps> No, that's probably really bothering her because she also know her brother. Like, dude, you a screw up. You going to Sodom. When, <laughs> when Abram told her, like, you going to where? Yeah, man, you know, me and Lot decided we're going to split up. Lot said he's going to go down to Sodom. Sarah probably was like, don't let him do that, man. You know he going to get out <laughs> there and mess that up. And <laughs> Abram's like, I got to. He about to mess up us right here. I, I I really I really see Sarah Sarah as like um you know especially after the event that happened in Egypt being prayerful and like you know her and I see her and her husband praying together I just see them praying together often and True. I feel like you know that um I kind of have a, a different view on Sarah as far as that I think that uh you know um she knows that uh it's coming it's coming for it's coming for a lot. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, there's only so much that you can do. And, and then there, you know, and I think inside of Abraham's mind, I don't know if the promises have been given to him about his heritage from his own loins. I don't know. If, I, don't, I don't know if he's still kind of confused, not confused, but if he's thinking, oh, it's just going to all go to Lot or it's going to go to Eleazar. No, it's going to Isaac. And he don't even see Isaac yet mm -hmm. in the scene. You see what I'm saying? So, so I just think that, you know, um, uh, it's just a walk of faith. It has to be clear. As you see, uh, you know, he's got all, he's, he's putting altars around the land. And this is what I wanted to say. I forgot, you know, well, anytime that we um, see that the Most High is talking about he's doing it for his glory, it's really that he's doing it because the glory of Yahuwah is that you find out that he is salvation. That's for the souls of men. It's not even really for him. His glory is not even, it's not even really for him because he don't need none of this down here. His glory is so that the other other men, sons and daughters of Noah can have salvation. True. That's the glory. And then it says that when you point to Yahuwah as salvation, then you're really talking about his word. You're talking about Yahushua. You mm -hmm. see, you know, and, uh, you know, and uh, that's that one that uh, Isaac is that one that was circumcised on that eighth day, you know, brought up into the covenant and laid hold to the covenant in his, in his birth instead of being circumcised at 99 years old as, as Abraham was, you know what I'm saying? But uh, so many pieces and so many layers to this story. It's so beautiful to hear it and to see, you know, the lessons from it. You know, uh, I, you know, I, I pull for a lot, but man, hey man, I'm trying to tell you, when you think it's just about, you know, and, and I think that's people is kind of looking at it like, you know, you got this pride, you got this covenant with Yah, you know, and I think kind of lot was kind of stepping back, you got this thing with, with Yah and I ain't got it. And I think a lot of people in the front and in, in the beginning of it was thinking, oh, it's just for you. No, you can stay with me and get it. Mm -hmm. You can do as I do and get it. You know stuff that Enoch and everybody done passed down to us. And, and the Shem done passed all this stuff down to us. You can have this. But they just start, it's, it just gets defined in Abraham's life. And so many miracles and so many things are happening in his life until people feel like they're not even in it. They just won't feel like they in it. They ain't got no chance at it or whatever. You know, and I think that's what happens with Esau. Esau is like, man, I don't really, I ain't really even, you know, man, let me just keep, let me just keep keep it, keep it pushing. You know, because this if I can't have it all, I don't want none of it. He, he, and it wasn't ever like that. It was just supposed to be where, you know, serve him. And that's the same thing that Cain did, man. Same thing, man. They just had this heart of animosity and contempt. And thinking that they can't all serve, all of us can serve Yah. You know what I'm saying? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No, most definitely. Um, 
And then that's saying a lot for Lot to have a mentality like that. Because from him being out of the lineage of Terra, you know, that he would understand that it was his chosen line from Shem and he's a part of it. But I could also see that where like, like you know, Yah is blessing you and doing this, this and that and the third for you. But he isn't um doing the same or I have not been given the same promises. But that's also him not, not reflecting, right? Because as Yah is blessing Abram from you being with me and being on the right page with me, um, Yah is blessing everybody around us. The servants is blessed. It said that on account of all of us, you know, all this cattle and all this, all these people and, you know, Yah is blessing everybody, but you are right. It is kind of Esau's mentality. Like, man, I, I'm going to do what I want to do. You know what I mean? Um, I ain't really, you know, that's that's y'all thing. I'm not really holding on to all of that. You do kind of see that today, but hallelujah, the Yah is changing the mentality. So more of us is understanding that it is a covenant to all of us. Um, hallelujah. And I agree with you. I do believe that Sarah and Abram, um, after what happened down in Egypt, I, I, we, we know that they praying a lot more because when she gets into it with him, she told him, Pray, pray and ask y'all to judge between us to see who was, you know, right or wrong. Like you, you do start to see them speak about prayer um, with each other more often. So I, you're right. She might have just prayed like, man, I know this knucklehead. She probably was just asking y'all to protect her brother. But mm -hmm. I'm sure it stung a little bit, too, that her brother was leaving from with them. No doubt. Especially if he was a younger brother. And I think he might have been younger. So. You know how that big sister role go too. Like, oh my God, I don't want to see him leave. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's that. That's that test. That's that test that no, no one is um, that you love me, love me with all your heart, soul, and might. You know, you know, there's nobody can be be between you and Yah. And it's just, uh, it's a test. That everybody's test is different. It's gonna be somebody that you know you're gonna, you know, that probably favored, and you know. You don't really realize that you favor them a little bit too much. I ain't saying that they're idle, but man, they they really, you know, they'll make you get off this path for a minute to, to and they let you hold up your walk for Yah, you know, you you know, so you you, you know that person has to be, um, as it says in Psalms one, most of the time that person is going to be ungodly, a sinner, or a scorner, and we can see that you know uh, he was definitely um, um, ungodly because he had people. Um, arguing and we can see that lot was ungodly and that psalms one he has to be in one of those but he was just unrighteous he didn't have the mind of yah to like i mean i ain't gonna cause no problem and make my uh because we see on down a little bit further yeah yakov saying you know uh when the stuff that happened i'm trying to think of what city it was in when they killed everybody um um uh shechem when uh he said you make at least stink you know and so, <laughs> So, you know, people you know that's that whole mindset, like, don't mess my reputation up. That's taking my name in vain. That's 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 uh, taking my name in vain. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Most yeah. definitely. And Yacob was representing Yah, you know, as, as, as the priesthood of the Melchizedek is coming down. That's how it's going. Abram's representing Yah. And when Yitzhak comes around, he's representing Yah. And then Yacob is representing Yah, you know, and then Yah chooses the Levitical priesthood to represent mm. him. And then mm. we get all the way down to Hamashiach and Hamashiach, like, yeah, y'all done fell off, so we finna do away with this. And then from now on, just the word of me, um, mm. my, the stories of me and the actions and the things that I'm doing in the name of Yah is gonna represent Yah, you know, as, mm. far, as, as far as a high priest type of role. Yeah. You gotta have somebody set apart, clean enough to talk to him. True. You can't. You just can't. You just can't. I mean, that's that's why we use Yahu. That's I shouldn't say we use, but that's why we have the lamb. I mean, you know, Yahusha is that lamb that sacrifice has always been remembered. That he covers us so he can go and talk to the Most High about us. Because the Most High doesn't look upon some of this stuff. He don't look upon none of this foolishness that actually we doing. You know, he's he's just too set apart for that. And he's always had a, a, a mediator. Of a covenant, you know, so that you know, um, that's what we get when we ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We 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 have to have a mediator, and that's why we're looking for the iniquity to be removed, and 
and we don't have to when, when we can enjoy our father as he as he wants us to enjoy enjoy him like face to face hallelujah hallelujah yeah let's see what's going on here it's a lot happening here right there seat of association is what it means it's he hebron uh, mentioned 71 times in scripture we ain't gonna go through them all but it's a lot that went on at hebron it's an important place in the lineage of the Israelites. Uh, I find it funny too in Genesis 13, 10, when Lot, it says, this is when Lot looked to go to Sodom and said, and Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Yarden, and it was well watered everywhere. Before Yahuwah destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of Yah, like the land of Egypt, which is probably why they went there because it was known to be plush considered probably from the Nile. Um, so the Jordan was keeping these this plain Sodom and Gomorrah plush and he compared it to the garden of Yah. Um, and we know that it ain't like that no more. <laughs> it's a little different, but yeah. Good old lie. And this this story just speaks to us being the people, man, because we didn't all have situations like this where you're doing something for everybody and they just really ungrateful. And you know what I'm saying? To the point to where it's like, yeah, I can't be, you know, doing all that. I'm sure we all didn't had a situation like that. I know I've had situations like that in my own life. So it's a lot of things to glean from this. Um, I think the most important thing, though, is that Abram is representing what we're supposed to be. As you say, honor thy father and thy mother, and it's good to learn about it. Know that this is your father, because how do will we honor Abram? And that's by being um, long-suffering and kind, because he's not trying to do this. You know, he's forgiving. Um, he represents all the traits of Yah, Abram would. So that's definitely um one of the more important things to glean from this is to always, uh, you know, look at Abram's life as, as, and even Sarah in the first part of this, as uh, Sarah's life and what happened with Egypt was representing, you know, the right side of obedience and the blessings from Yah and how that's going to go. And, and even how in her, when she was in her most tumultuous state, she state, she prayed, um, we definitely could take that from that as well. Hallelujah. Uh, I, I'd like to say uh, one thing Go about ahead. the relationship between uh, uh, Lot, the nephew, and his uncle, uh, Abram, uh, is that uh, Abram uh, took on the role as his uh, uh mentor or his 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 father what his father would have been to him and he knew that uh he could only say so many times and teach so many things to lot that at some point he had to get out on his own and he had enough that uh, he wouldn't suffer that uh, once he got out on his own he was going to start to see the things that he was doing was wrong. So he had to learn by experience being on his own as a man, <coughs> excuse me, a man uh, uh, out uh, to make his way in the world has to stand up and take account for his actions. Because I think uh, when, <laughs> the angels uh, came into uh, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah that uh, he saw all the wrongdoing that was going on. He chose to live there, but he wanted to protect them from those people that lived there because he had started to learn or he, he had learned that as a man, he had to stand up and he had to stand up for right because that's what he, that's how he was raised. He yeah. knew better. And I just, that's just what I wanted to say. No, I, yeah, you are correct. He knew better. He was raised better, most, most definitely. And 
by this point in the story, he's been with, because it just said they were in Canaan 10 years. So he's been with Abram. And aside from growing up with Haran and in Tara's house and knowing Abram, but he's been with Abram. It said at this time, they've been in Canaan for 10 years since Egypt. And I can't even remember how many years they were in Canaan before they went to Egypt. So you're looking at a 15, 20 year period that he's been with Abram, um, which is definitely long enough to understand if you didn't know, which I believe you already knew, but that's long enough to understand. Um, you know, this is how things work. This is how Yah, you know, Abram's been raised in the ways of Yah, and this is how it's supposed to go. So I do agree. Him stepping out, he learned that he had to stand on his own too, and part of standing on his own too. He had to do what was right. And, and you know, that showed that it, even with him, that when things, when the rubber met the road and it really got bad, um, him trying to protect those angels in the way he did what he did is, 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 is probably what saved him and his daughters and even would have saved his wife's life if she didn't look back. Agree. Hallelujah. Anything else anybody want to add or take away before we pray out? Abram. It's always a lot to these stories with Abram. We will make sure we take our time as we go through this because the next few chapters is about him. Um, chapter 19 is where it talks about Eliezer going on, I believe. So we're getting close. This next few chapters is actually going to be about Sodom. So we keep that in mind. As we humble ourselves and prepare our hearts to pray out and give all glory and praise to the Most High Yah. Um, it's just Toda Rabbah once again, I'll be out for allowing us to gather in thy name and to read um, the history of our people, Father Yah, and to compare it and contrast it with other ancient scrolls that have been inspired by you, Father, and to um, learn more of our ancestral history, our culture, our heritage, and not to just know it or learn it for sake of um, just trying to stack knowledge or whatnot or to appear to be smart, but um, to learn it and to know it, to understand the ways of our ancestors is when they were obedient to you and when they were disobedient. So we know how to live and also not how to live. Um, as a blueprint, Father, you ought to help us to get on this ancient path and to keep our hands on the plow and stay focused on your mark as we know our ancestor Abram um, has done. Um, and we thank you for opening up this knowledge to us, Father, you and for giving us the understanding and the wisdom to apply the things that we see from this for our, to our lives, Abiyah. Uh, we thank you for our, our grandmother, Sarah, um, as she prayed when we she was in, um, when she needed you the most, she prayed and you were there, Abiyah. We take that um, from her and understand that as we grow in this word and we grow back into your covenant and learning the ways um, that we just remember to pray um, with everything that's going on in our own lives, I'll be I, and ask for your forgiveness always, even when we think we're right, know that we could be wrong, um, and to ask you to continue to be patient and merciful towards us, Father, Yah, as your Torah say that you will, showing mercy and forgiving the iniquity of thousands upon thousands, I believe your word says, Father, Yah, uh, and we just thank you for turning your ear and your face back to your chosen people, um, your remnant and whomever you choose, Father Yah, and we pray that we are worthy to have that ear. Um, and we just ask you to continue to forgive us, Father Yah, and continue to, um, even if you have to chastise us, I'll be out to do it as a loving father would and to show us um, where we can correct ourselves, um, clean up our households, as my coach has been saying to me a lot lately, Father Yah, um, and to get ourselves together with you, Father Yah, to be um, worthy. Um, as the, the as Joel said, we've been reading in the day of Yah, who can abide in it? And if it, if it be your holy will, Father, we just pray that we be worthy to abide, to be sustained and protected in that day. Um, I pray for everybody who um, is here, Father Yah, that you continue to strengthen our vessels, 
um, cleanse our vessels and fill us with your light and your Torah, Father Yah. Um, be the supreme authority in our lives, Father Yah, that we bring all thoughts um, into subjection to you, Father Yah, and under, under your jurisdiction, Father, so that we can, um, you know, just get further away from our worldly ways as we still battle this Babylonian captivity and all the things we've learned in our lives, Father Yah, but we give you all honor, glory, and praise. We know that nothing is too hard for you, and we just continue, Father, humbly with humility and meekness as we bow the knee before your throne to come to you, Father Yah, and ask that um, you continue to guide us um, through this valley of the shadow of death um, and let your Torah or the word of Yah, which is your only begotten son, Yahushua HaMashiach, um, to, to uh, intercede on our behalf and be our kinsman redeemer, um, to be our king and our leader and to lead us on this path back to you um, clean enough one day to be presented worthy, Father Yah, uh, to be a vessel in your temple and to dwell amongst you forever. Uh, we pray for, um, we continue to pray for my Koti Lauren and her son, Abi Yah, as, as you continue to work a miracle in their lives, Father, that your glory can be seen. Um, I pray that you have mercy on their household and that you your will be done and that you continue to guide all decisions that need be made for Ox CJ um, and that you strengthen them wherever he's weak, Abba Yah, that you humble him, that you humble humble their family um, and you continue to um, show them to lean more to your Torah, to lean to your word no matter what goes on, uh, to stay faithful and to know that you are in control of all things. We pray for strength. We pray for health, I'll be uh, And we just pray for righteous prosperity in the name of Yahushua HaMashiach. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 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 All praise. Hallelujah. Shalom, shalom, everyone. Shalom. Layla Tov, everybody. Layla Tov. Shalom, shalom. Shalom. shalom.